everyone in the chat. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our very special event today featuring John Grisham and Louise Penny. My name is Jamie Rogers Southern. I'm Interim Executive Director at Bookmarks. If you're unfamiliar with us, we are a literary arts nonprofit organization and independent bookstore based in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. We are celebrating 16 years this year of inspiring the love of reading in our community. And although we have had to shift everything online, we've had a great time connecting with people from around the world through events like the one today. I just wanna mention a few things before we turn this over to John and Louise. If you have questions for either author, if you'll please submit them in the Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. If you do experience technical difficulties or if you need to leave early, just wanna let you know that this is being recorded and you can access it following the event. So just look for a follow-up email that will come from Bookmarks with that link. If you purchased one of the author's books and would like to purchase the other, from Bookmarks, you can do so. I'm gonna put the link in the chat for you. We are also still offering the discounted bundle rate on the same page if you want to purchase both books. They do make excellent holiday gifts. So now I'm gonna introduce our guests. John Grisham is the author of 35 novels, one work of nonfiction, a collection of stories, and seven novels for young readers. His first novel, A Time to Kill, has sold more than 300 million copies, and since, he has written consecutive bestsellers. His new novel, A Time for Mercy, features Jake Brigance, the hero of A Time to Kill. Jake returns in a courtroom drama that the New York Times says is riveting and suspenseful. Louise Penny is the author of the number one New York Times and Globe and Mail bestselling series of Chief Inspector Armand Gamache, which began with Still Life. She's won numerous awards, including the Agatha Award seven times, and she was a finalist for the Edgar Award for Best Novel. In 2017, she received the Order of Canada for her con contributions to Canadian culture. Uh, All the Devils Are Here is Louise's 16th novel, which finds Chief Inspector Armand Gamache investigating a sinister plot in the City of Light. And the world knows John Gershom and Louise Penny as fantastic writers. And I wanna say that having hosted both before in person, I can attest to the fact that they are also both fantastic humans. I'm grateful to them both for their support and for agreeing to be here with us today. So please welcome from your homes, John Grisham and Louise Penny. Hi, John, can you hear me? Can you, yeah, I can hear you, can you hear me? I can, I can even see you. It's working, something works. I know, yes, exactly. How are you? Congratulations. Thank you so and congratulations to you. Where are you? I'm in London. London, yeah. why London? Well, I have a place here and I, I just, I love London. I, I, every time I get on a plane, it seems it's coming to London. Yeah, my husband has a, had a sister here and we came here a lot and he went to university. So you know, I got to bond with the place. Now, I think we have a shared love of Paris though. Yeah, and uh, your book is a big fat wet kiss to Paris. I mean, it was not like, uh, <laughs> a French kiss even. <laughs> I said, I kept thinking, I, I've been there. I know that place. I, I know that neighborhood. I know that street. I know that. Uh, ah, well, I, I should have had you with me. You and your wife walking me that through. Tower before. But see, you're Canadian. You can travel abroad. We can't. We're on everybody's hit list, and we can't go to Paris. We can't go to London. We can't go anywhere. And yet you have such a good French accent as you speak. That is <laughs> that's, uh, that's called Mississippi, okay? Okay. How much time do you spend in London? I'm sorry? How much time do you spend in London? Um... Of course, this year, I was supposed to come, actually, I was in New York, and I had my my tickets. I had actually downloaded the tickets for the 15th of March. I was going to get on a plane in a few hours. And, you know, it was really scary. And I want to talk, it was very few times in my life have I completely been at a loss of what the right thing is to do. Yeah. I had no idea, do I get on the plane, come to London, where I know people and I feel safe, I have a flat, or do I go home? To Quebec where I'm even safer. I honestly, I was paralyzed and it was a very, it was an incredibly disconcerting feeling. I eventually went across the border uh, back to Quebec because I had dinner with a friend and he asked, 
if you got sick, where would you feel safest? Right. right. And I thought that was that really cut to the, the quick. Yeah. How about you? How often do you get, well, you must travel a lot for your. Well, yeah, back in the good old days, uh, before uh, COVID, before March, uh, I was going to be in, in France twice this spring for book festivals, which is always fun. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one trip to London, several book festivals here. Uh, all that got canceled, of course, with, you know, with everything else. But we, we normally go to Paris um, two, sometimes three times a year. And that's our favorite place to go to and hang out there and uh, have a small apartment there. And uh, we, oh. we really, really enjoy it. That's why I enjoyed your book so much. I just felt like oh. I, was, I was walking around. Why would you send Armand Gamache to uh, Paris? Just for the fun of it? Well, I, you know, I knew eventually I'd have to get him out of... Canada. It was, it was like, almost like a reset. Most of my books, as you know, are set in Quebec, near the border with Vermont, in quite a, a small village, although not all the crimes happen there. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit like your, your town, where a lot has happened in the, in the town. Um, but I just, I really wanted a, a, like a refresher, you know, I, I wanted him to see him in a different setting. I wanted to get away from Three Pines for a little while. It's a bit of a risk, I knew, because I know that a lot of readers uh, have bonded with Three Pines with the characters there. Right. right. Um, but I felt it was really, I thought it was time. And, and, and Paris, I mean, it doesn't hurt that it's Paris and not Moscow or... or yeah. You know. I think uh, Gamache should travel more, because she should get out more often. And... Uh, and visit, oh, <laughs> visit all these tax deductions. I get to go to Paris. I remember, oh yeah, it's tax deductible. I'll come to oh, London. Why didn't I think of London? <laughs> I've never oh, used, oh, I've never used London. I've used, um, oh, 20 years ago, I was going to write a book that uh, could be set anywhere in the world. And I love, I love Italy. We, we love to travel in, in Europe, but especially France and Italy. And at that time, I was going to Italy a lot, and I had never been to certain regions. So I took a dart and threw it at a map of Italy, and it landed on Bologna. No. And I'd never been to Bologna. So, okay, this is where the book's going to be set. So I had to go there three times and, you know, eat all the food. And it's tax deductible, okay? It's a business expense. This is it. The writers, uh, we're, we're lucky writers in that we get to do that. We travel yeah. around and see. And we can write anywhere. We could, we could set up on a beach if, if we if just have a laptop. Do you write on a laptop? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I wrote my first two books in longhand uh, oh and got away from that pretty quick. Well, no I wonder it's called A Time to Kill. I would be. <laughs> yeah, it's a, st a stack of legal pads. When I got finished, it was a foot high. I, I gave it to my secretary one day and said, type this up. She said, what is it? I said, it's, well, it's not a brief or a lawsuit. It's a, it's a novel. And uh, she didn't want to do it. Uh, but, you know, she, I was paying her, so she had to type the manuscript of A Time to Kill. And uh, then I would edit and fix it and, you know, back and forth with her. And it was a thousand pages long when she got fitted, far too long. I began submitting it to New York. This is 1987. And um, the rejections, you know, came in. I thought the rejections were fun because they were, uh, you know, it was some contact with the, pub the publishing world. And uh, so I went back and forth. But uh, shortly after the firm, I started writing on a little cheap, uh, one of the first generation of word processors. And uh, that speeds things up considerably. And once you get spoiled to it and all the fancy things you can do with one now, I still work offline. I refuse to work online. I just had this fear of getting hacked. And so oh. I, uh, in my, my little office at the house where I write is uh, this dark place with uh, no phones, no fax, no internet, no music, just, you know, me and coffee every morning at seven o'clock. So uh, that's, that's where I write. Wow. No, when you're, I want to go back to a time to kill when your secretary was typing it and clearly reading it. Did she say anything about it? Did she say, John, this is brilliant. I'm so glad you're doing it. Or did she say, you know what? No, I don't recall any reaction from her. She was actually kind of glad to get it because I would leave each year in January. Uh, I did this for two terms in the state legislature and I would leave uh, and drive three hours away to the state capitol in Jackson, Mississippi for three months, you know, five days a week for three months. And uh, so she wasn't that busy. My law office was never that busy <laughs> even when I was there, but uh, she didn't have a whole lot to do. And so she kind of enjoyed typing uh, the manuscript and, and dealing with the, uh, 
back then in 1987, you submitted, it was a classic submission rejection, you know, routine, and you could submit to both agents and publishers. And I had a list. I didn't know what I was doing. I'd never, I'd never written a book before or tried to get it published. And so I had a list of, I still got the list, a list of 30 publishers and 30 agents. And I would send the top 10 to each one. And she, she would uh, send the first three chapters, uh, the cover letter, the hook, whatever. And we'd send those packages out, you know, long before the internet. And uh, they would send them right back <laughs> with the rejection letters. And so when she, got, when she got one packet back, she would go to the next name on the list, cross out one and stick it in another envelope. So at any given time, I had like 10 manuscripts floating around, 10 submissions floating around New York. And um, Can you yeah. imagine, have you run into any of these people who said, oh God, we turned down a time to kill? Yeah, a couple. One, one lady, I won't call her name, but she, is a, she became a very dear friend. She's still a very dear friend of the family. And she still kicks herself in the butt for turning down a time to kill. Um, but yeah, I, 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 kept, I, kept all, I kept all the rejection letters. Oh, did you? You see, now I sent out still life, like to everybody. I got those, and this was also before the internet. Um, so I, I got the, um, God, it was, it was like a, it was a Bible for, for published for writers on yeah. agents and publishers. And I went through it. And like you made a list and sent out uh, the first three uh, chapters, um, an outline and a uh, covering letter and the self-addressed stamped S-A-S-E, self-addressed stamped envelope, where you'd expect the million dollar check would come back and raves and things. But you know what? I heard back from one. What I, The problem, my, I, nobody even bothered writing back. There was just this Silence, and I, and I can laugh about it now, but at the time it was pretty soul destroying. It was very upsetting to, to send it out into nothing. And I thought, well, it must be a big pile of merd if nobody can even bother to send back a self-addressed stamped envelope. <laughs> and the only, one I, the only one I got back and I kept it was my own letter, self-addressed, with no written across it. <laughs> I love it. The, the, the first rejection letter I got um, was from a guy, believe it or not, who uh, was an editor at Doubleday. And I won't call his name. Long-time editor. He was a oh, he was on, a, nobody, a nobody, fairly nobody. high-ranking editor at Doubleday. And he sent me a personal note. It was a personal letter signed by him. And it said some nice things about the book. Uh, but then he said, you know, it's just not right for us. They've got, they got a, you know, a whole list of reasons uh, to, to turn you down. And I was so excited because I've read all these writers' books about how to get published and Writer's Digest and Publishers Weekly. And, you know, I, I knew how to get published. I thought, I couldn't wait to go home and show my wife this wonderful rejection letter. <laughs> I, thought, I said, somebody, somebody liked my book. But I, but I got, I, you know, I got some really nice rejection letters. I got some, I got some kind of um, not, not, uh, not insulting ones, but kind of crude ones. Uh, you know, I'm just too busy and, and it was, it's kind of a funny story. After about, I don't know, 20 or so rejection letters, I came home from the state capitol one Friday afternoon and our children were small and my wife was cooking dinner and I hadn't seen them all week. And, and we sat down for dinner and I said, I'd, I'd stopped by the office and, and saw a stack of rejection letters. And I, I said, you know, I got some more rejection letters uh, this week for a time to kill. And she said, uh, I'm, she's, I'm sorry to hear that. And again, I was never, uh, I was busy as a lawyer, busy as a dad, busy as a, uh, a politician. I, you know, this was a little secret hobby of mine. I didn't take it that serious. And she said, um, she said, well, look, you're submitting the first three chapters. And those are not the best chapters in the book. Why don't you submit a ch chapter one, which is very uh, dramatic, and then maybe chapter three where this happens, and then maybe chapter seven where this happens. And I said, you mean three random chapters? And she said, yeah. And I said, that's pretty stupid. Who wants to read three, three random chapters? And she said, well, you're not doing so hot on your own. Why don't you listen to me for a change? And I said, you know what? I said, what the heck? And this, is, this is a game. This is fun. So I did that. I submitted chapters um, one, three, and seven, I think, to the next 10 on the list. And within a week, three of them had called. 
And so my wife, of course, she, you know, I, I listened to that noise for a long time. And uh, that, that's how I got an agent. And uh, once I got the agent, um, he then took the book and, and resubmitted to everybody I already submitted to. They said no the second time. And then he, well, a year passed. A year passed. And I mean, a time to kill was getting rejected everywhere. And, you know, that's not that unusual in publishing. Um, how long did it take with Still Life before you got published? You it took about three years. Three years. Before, it was even, before I got an agent. And that, had, that only happened because I had entered a contest and didn't win, but at least I got the, uh, got the eye of an agent. Were you submitting to New York publisher or Canadian publishers or both? Everyone. I, if I could have sent it into, into space, I would have and would have been rejected. I would have been an intergalactic failure. But yes, I, I was anybody who... Yeah, I would take it down to the local village post office, the poor postmistress, and she got used to me coming in, right, with this thing. And I would, I would, I would do little incantations over it. I would kiss it goodbye. I would send it out, and she'd be saying, "Oh my God!" Oh. and then I would go immediately back to the mailbox and check if there was an answer yet. <laughs> and you were, did you keep writing during the, during that process? I did. I had started the second book, but I. Um, it wasn't good and I ended up not using a lot of what I had written. I, I how was your second book? I, I found the second book just excruciatingly difficult to write. You, you know, Louise, I, it was not difficult for me. A Time to Kill was difficult to write because of the subject matter and because of the racial tension and because of the crime. It's a very unpleasant thing to write. It's the rape of a little girl. When I wrote that in 1985, I did not have a daughter, and I'm not sure I could have written that. I couldn't write it now. I don't like to go back and read it. And that turned a lot of people off, so I was getting a, but that. But that took, that book was, a, it took three years to write it while I was very busy elsewhere. And so it, when it was published in 1989, it was a complete flop. We finally found a small publisher to print 5,000 copies in New York. I got, I got an advance of $15,000, which I really needed. Um, but I told, my, I told my wife, I was also writing the second book as the first book came out. And I, I told her, I said, I'm going to try one more book. And if that doesn't work, you can forget this career. I'll just go sue people. That's what I'm supposed to be doing anyway, just if, I, if I can find any clients. And the second book was a lot more fun to, it was a lot, it's a lot lighter, a lot more fun to write. And then when the firm came out in uh, March of 91, everything changed immediately. And, right. Uh, the first book was then rediscovered and, and, you know, became a popular novel too. What was your first advance? Uh, it was 25000 a book. And I had a three book contract and that was in 2000. And so it would have been, you know, pretty closely the equivalent of what you got. Uh, that was in 2005 was uh, that. And, you know, it took me a long time. Because it appeared to be once Still Life came out, and it did quite well, although it didn't actually sell all that well. It got a lot of attention, a lot of awards. But you know, as you know, sometimes the, the sales don't match up with the, uh, with the hype. Um, I would say it was probably, I remember going to the, uh, the accountant with my husband, Michael, who was so supportive. And it, I think the book six or seven had come out, and the accountant, we were doing the taxes, and the accountant turned to me and he said, how long do you think you will be a deduction? <laughs> it was like we haven't turned a corner yet. I would say it was probably after book six or seven that we be, that I began to make enough money that I could have supported myself. Yeah. How long did it, when you? I guess with the firm, like with the when you were writing the firm, did you know? Did you have a sense that this is going to be special? No, I didn't know what to expect. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I had, um, when I sent the manuscript off, the, the complete manuscript to my first agent of, for a time to kill, sent the book off, he and I signed a contract. And I, um, I contacted him, I called him the next day, sent it by FedEx. And I said, now what happens? You know, what, what, you know what's going to happen? And he's kind of a crusty old New York guy. And he said, um, Look, don't call me every day," he said. Uh, he said, "Let me." I said, "I'm going to give you some advice, and you listen to me." And this guy had been around the block many times. He said, "You start writing another book. Uh, by the time you get it finished, I'll have this thing sold. And it'll keep you busy, and you won't be calling me every day." I said, <laughs> okay, okay. 
and I sent him a uh, two page uh, treatment summary synopsis of the firm, which was just a working title because obviously I struggle with titles. I, I thought there was no way that the firm was going to last as a title. Uh, my wife, Renee, was, had always been uh, crazy about the book. She loved the set up, the premise. She just loved that book uh, when I first started talking about it. And so um, I sent the, the summary to my agent, and he called me the next day. And he said, this is a big book. Hurry up and get it written. And I said, uh, okay. It took me two years uh, to get it written. And then by, by then the time the kill had, had uh, arrived and didn't make much of a splash. And he had the, the firm in New York for a few months and showed it to a few editors. Nobody wanted to buy it. And oh. it was, uh, he wanted me to make some changes to the story that I, I didn't want to make. And so we were kind of feuding back and forth. And I was, I was tied up in a really big lawsuit that took a lot of time and I just kind of lost interest. And then I got a phone call uh, one Sunday morning in early Sunday morning in Ju January of 1990. And it was my agent uh, telling me that we had just sold the film rights, not the book rights, the film rights uh, to, the, to the firm uh, to Paramount Pictures. I didn't know that they, uh, they were showing it to movie company. I, I was waiting, I said, what about a book deal? He said, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> said, okay, <laughs> I said, okay, great, we got a movie deal. And it was a big deal. And then the, the publishers woke up and uh, after two weeks later, our dear friend David Gernert, who was a uh, uh, editor at Doubleday, purchased uh, the firm, and uh, and then for you know it was a nice advance, and then remarkably we uh, we just kind of sat back and watched the book march around the world, language by language by language, and so throughout the, that entire year, 1990, um, we were in shock. Uh, we just couldn't we couldn't believe. Yeah. And then when the book was finally published in 91, I remember we were talking about after all the hype and the buzz and all this, is it actually going to sell? Because we were kind of nervous about it. So it did. It's a, yeah, no, it, it is. It's, it's a, it is a life changing moment. Isn't it? When you realize that, that you, that you've got a career and that you can, yeah. you can sustain yourself. And then you have a, a moment like this. I, I often think how, how lucky I am. I, I don't think I thought it at the time that it did take a few books to actually yeah. begin to hit because I appreciated it. And I, had, I had, you know, I sort of worked my literary muscles and done the, the tours. Michael and I paid for the first few tours and nobody showed up. And it was, you know, I would, poor Michael would sit in the audience and I would be talking to him and he'd be mouthing the words along with me. <laughs> it, was, it, it was awful, but it was also fun. It was, you know, yeah. sort of paying your dues and then, now when you show up and, and a whole bunch of people are there, I am deeply grateful for anyone who shows up. You'd never forget those uh, early book signings when you showed up. Uh, what would happen is you would get to the bookstore and the staff is eager to see you because they love to have writers. They're also kind of nervous. You look around the store and there's nobody else there but the staff and they have a table with your books uh, by the front door and they're watching the clock very closely because they're waiting for the crowd to show up. And when the crowd does not materialize, the staff starts uh, disappearing. And they leave you at the table by yourself with a stack of books for two hours. And it's the most miserable thing in the world. Nobody shows up. Uh, I, I've had a couple of those with the time to kill. And, um, uh, you know, I remember that very well. Uh, I, tell, I tell aspiring writers now, that, you know, the, the rejection part is very much, uh, still very much a part of publishing. Uh, deal with it. Um, right. If you're lucky enough to get a book tour, uh, and back then there were a lot more book tours than are, are, there are now in modern publishing. Um, if you Do you still go on tour? I did with the first two books, and then I stopped because I just got, uh, with the Pelican Brief, which is 1992, they put me on one of these 35 city tours in 34 days, one of these things that just, you know, you forget where you are. And I said, I am not doing this again. Uh, the books are selling well. I'm just going to stay home and write. And Doubleday said, yeah, why don't you just go write? And so for years, I would go to the same five bookstores uh, in Mississippi, old friends of mine who had helped me out with The Time to Kill, 
the one was in Memphis, and I would uh, do those stores every year. And the, but the signings got to be where they were. Uh, we I signed books one time for fifteen hours, and oh we and we realized that people would wait a long, long time to mm. get a book signed. And that may sound romantic, but it's not any fun. I got tired of so I stopped. I stopped all touring until about three years ago. Uh, when I uh, published a book called Camino Island, which is a, I, I call it, it's a beach book. It's not, there's no lawyers in it. It's just a beach book. And uh, I toured uh, to quite a few stores and everywhere I went, um, I would invite a local writer or somebody close by to come to the store with a big crowd stuffed in the, you know, crowd in the bookstore or some, some, some more events off, off site. And uh, we, we would talk for an hour, take questions and we did, we did a podcast and that was a lot of fun. I got to meet a lot of writers and it was, I really enjoyed it. So I'm, I'm going to do more of that after COVID when we get back on the road, it's fun to go around. I've got a list of writers I want to meet um, and, and do a book gig with at a bookstore, including okay. you. We'll do one in Canada. Oh, 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 wouldn't that be fun? Yes. They'll sneak you across the border. I was up there two years ago with John Irving in Toronto. We did oh, that. He's a great writer. <laughs> my God. One of my favorites. What, what's, yeah. what's the nearest big city to you? Montreal? Montreal, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I'm just, when I fly out, I fly out of Burlington. I go across the border in Vermont and, and, and fly out there. Yeah. How did you decide? How did, I'm curious about bringing Jake back. How did you decide that it was time to bring him back? Because you, you brought him back before. For two, yeah. Two uh, he, he came out in 89 with a time to kill. Right. And 24 years went by uh, before he came back seven years ago with Sycamore Row. Right. And I, uh, um, I, I was busy writing the legal thrillers, the other books, and uh, having far too much fun with them. And I, um, I knew Jake had a lot of fans, but I was surprised. Um, Sycamore Row kind of surprised me to realize how popular he really was. Mm -hmm. uh, the movie helps tremendously. Matthew McConaughey helps tremendously, and they they see him as Jake, which is fine with me. Um, and I was kind of surprised at the uh, the acceptance of, of that book. And after that, after 2013, I said, okay, I'm, I, you know, I'm going to bring Jake back again. It all goes back to the story. I had to wait for a story. I had to wait for a good a good trial, a good murder case to bring Jack ba Jake back to the courtroom. And found one a couple of years ago and started working on it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you. I, I. I'm. This whole movie adaptation thing is 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 a bit of a struggle, you know. Especially with a series character, with like like I have a series character. I've got the all the the secondary characters, the village, the location. That's all so um, precious to me. Yeah. That I find it very difficult to um, to agree to anyone adapting it. Um, have you been happy with your adaptations? I have been very lucky with Hollywood. I've had um, 10 books adapted. Uh, eight were feature films. One was a TV movie and one was a documentary. Uh, the documentary, right. documentary was uh, two or three years ago, The Innocent Man, a true story. I loved that. Yeah, yeah. Very well done. And I realized a long time ago that uh, it's best to stay away, <clears throat> stay away from the movie business. Uh, so I, I try to deal with good people, and there are a lot of good people in the business, really talented directors and producers and actors. Uh, we try to deal with folks that we know, good reputations, who make good movies, and sell the film rights and get out of the way. It's going to be something. Uh, it's going to be something different, uh, you know. But I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure I would do that with, the, with the, a series like yours because at some point, you know, you've got you know who Gamash is. You know who his, his, the characters are. Uh, do you want to see somebody else's interpretation of that? See, that's the struggle I have, is, is allowing the filmmakers to, to do their adaptation, make it into a film or a, or a TV series, um, which isn't a book. But at the same time, these characters are flesh and blood to me. They have certain characteristics. Um, and I feel a real ownership uh, of them. So I, I just don't know how, how, how involved to get, how, how much it might mess with my mind. <laughs> how, how much it might interfere too with writing the next book. Yeah, I would, I would worry about that. Yeah, 
I've got a kid series going, uh, Theodore Boone, Kid Lawyer. There's seven books now in that series. And we've had um, movie and TV talk over the years. Uh, nothing real serious. We've, we've not been close to it. But filming a kid uh, is is very tricky because they grow up they grow up so fast. You start filming a, a child actor who's twelve or thirteen, he's going to be gone in a year or two. I mean, he's going to be too old for it. And so that's I, that's that's been a problem there. Now that Gamash is so popular, do you worry about uh, writing a book that's not Gamash? That's an interesting question. <sighs> to be honest with you. I mean, I mean I've, I've had like one idea and it's a pretty good idea and I'm perfectly happy writing Gamash forever. So I don't really feel the need to write something else because these, these aren't really murder mysteries. I mean, they are, they're absolutely and proudly crime right. novels, but the crime is probably the least interesting part of it. It's, it's about all, the crime is really, describe it as, as the Trojan horse on which all sorts of other themes and philosophies and, and uh, areas of, of discussion can, can ride in. But the crime is the least interesting. So as a result, I can write Gamash and these other characters forever because there's always something interesting to explore. Often themes that I don't really know what the answer is myself. So I, it's, a, it's something that I struggle with, a philosophy, something that's unclear. Um, because it takes a year. It takes me a year to write a book. Now, a, a, a crime isn't a theme. It's an act. A murder is an act. So uh, that wouldn't interest me. It wouldn't hold my interest for a whole year. It has to be about more than that. Um, about family, about belonging, our yearning for community. What happens when that community is threatened? Uh, I, I spent a lot of time growing up, moving from place to place, not putting down roots, but for me, home is so important, always has been, and I, I've searched for it for much of my life. I finally, as an Anglo-Canadian born and raised in Toronto, oddly enough, I found it in French Quebec. And so I want to reflect that in the books, and it gives me joy every time I, I, I open up the laptop and, and write about this community and, and the friendship and the, the community itself, obviously, it's not a safe place. It's a beautiful place, but it's not a safe place. I don't mean that physically. No place is safe. I started writing shortly after 9-11. And I think what, even as a Canadian, certainly much more so from Americans, what came home was that, that there is no such thing as safety. Right. Anything can happen at any time. I mean, look at, the, look at what's happening around us now. But I yearned for that. So I wrote, I created, I didn't think the book would be published, so I created a village I would want to live in with the sense of belonging and a sense of safety, but not physical safety. It is a spiritual, it's an emotional safety that comes with friendship. Yeah. That's, that then allows me to, to write about this forever. Like I can write about my husband forever and my friends forever. I want to visit them the rest of my life. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the, the pleasure of opening up the laptop each day. Um, how do you do that? What, what's the writing uh, routine? What's the schedule? What's the deadline? How, how do you do it? I, I, I'm a morning writer. What about you? Do you write in the morning or afternoon? Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. Seven Seven yeah, I set my alarm generally for about 5.30. Sometimes I hit snooze. Get up, make a cup of coffee, get right to the laptop. Some, I spent actually about half an hour, I probably shouldn't do this, but Googling around, seeing what's happened in the world sending out some emails to the people and then I'm then I'm at the laptop and fresh and writing I write every day I am un John I took a, a, a personality test once uh you know in those magazines you get in doctor's offices about what's your cardinal quality is it is it kindness is it patience uh, is are you loving it turns out my cardinal quality is sloth <laughs> <laughs> not a big surprise. So I have to be really disciplined. Otherwise, I'm going to sit on the sofa all day eating jelly beans and, and watching the Great British Bake Off. So, so a good day for you is how many words? A thousand. I, I, I need to be very, I'm very goal-oriented. It helps to know yourself, doesn't it? There's no wrong answer. 
some people can just sit down and, and write. I, I, I can, I sit down and write, but I need a goal. So it has to be a thousand words, it can be more, yeah. but it can be less. Often the words are really bad. <laughs> yeah. God, it's really stinky. Uh, it is, it's, it's the same, same here, a thousand a day when I'm working is, uh, is the goal. Um, a really what, what's your first draft? Do what? What, how long would your first draft be? I aim for 400 pages, 100,000 words. That's my goal. Uh, right. This book, uh, because of COVID, I couldn't go anywhere, so I just stayed home and kept writing. It's the thickest book yet. It's 175,000 words, and that's, I don't like thick books, to read or to write. Is it 175,000 yeah. words? Yep. Yeah, I too, too much. Again, again, 100,000 words is, is always my goal. About 400 pages, uh, because that's what I like to read. Uh, mm -hmm. Whatever the book is, even nonfiction, I, I just don't want to pick up a 700-page book. Uh, so how did this, I must tell you, I went, I, had, I went around London yesterday, finding, looking for your book, which was very difficult because every store was, was sold out. And I, I want to thank you for making me buy it and not sending one. <laughs> Double I should have sent you a book. Uh, David, Gern, David Gurner should have sent you a David book. David Gurner, our agent, which we share, should have, he's going to get a stern letter of complaint, I'll tell you. Yeah, so, but I went all over London trying to find your book. But it is, it's, how did it end up 106? Because you, I mean, it must have started at like 200 for you. And then you must do, do you do second and third drafts? Or no, I, what I do is uh, I start each day around 7 or 7.30 by rereading what I wrote the day before. Right. And mm -hmm. I do a lot of editing then. And even when I'm, and, I, and I'll write for about four hours. Beyond four hours, my brain is mush and I've got to, I've got to leave it. Uh, but the rest of the day when I'm into a novel, uh, I'll be thinking about, you know, the next scene or the last scene. Uh, I, I do a lot, I do some research, checking facts, you know, during the day uh, on a computer or making phone calls or wherever, maybe even going somewhere. Uh, and then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll clean it up the next day. So mm -hmm. by the time I get to the end, it's, it's in fairly good shape. Then my wife reads it. Um, she reads some of it along as I'm writing toward the end. And she reads with a red magic marker that she loves to use. And she has a lot of opinions about, you know, the books and I listen and we argue. And anyway, I'll, I'll take her notes and clean that up and send that to David for the thorough, you know, line edit that he, that's where he's, what he's so good at. Right. He goes through the book and, and it takes him about three days and he, you know, makes a lot of suggestions. Now, then I'll clean that up. And so I, I guess Doubleday gets about the third draft or fourth draft. Uh, and it's, it's in pretty good shape when it goes in. I don't do a lot of cutting um, uh, as I go. I mean, I'll, I'll cut daily, but I, I don't like to take out huge sections of the book because they're not working. I want to know if it's not working long before I get that far along. And, you know, the, the, the editing and copy editing, that takes another six weeks to get a book ready and it goes to press. And so that's, that's kind of the routine. I do that. I start a new book in January. I finish in July. And by Labor Day, I'm bored again, and so I start writing something else. I'm, <laughs> I'm writing another book right now because I, you know, because I just, you know, you you have to. We write for a living. We write every day. And right. if if I didn't write, I mean, between the hours of seven and eleven each day, if I didn't write, there's nothing else to fill that time. Uh, well, that's what happened to me in the in the pandemic. I just I was just finishing the edits on on um, the the uh, All the Devils Are Here. And the pandemic happened. Then I, I crossed into Canada and was in 14 days quarantine. And I thought, great, you know, now I can watch the Great British Bake Off and, and eat gummy bears. And I, yeah, after a day or two, I was like, now what? So I started writing the next book. Um, but I, I, I had a life changing moment in, in writing the second book because I, the first book was written just for the joy of it. Like you, no one was paying any attention. Nobody knew, Michael knew, and that was it. Um, uh, and then, but the, I, then I had a three book contract. So I had to write, it took me 45 years to write the first book. <laughs> I had to write the second book in the year. I was like, oh no. So I started writing and what I wrote was out of fear. And I don't write well when I'm afraid. Uh, I was afraid that I couldn't do it. I didn't know how I had done the first one. It seemed magic. Um, and I, I knew that I was playing it safe. I was writing for the approval of others rather than just for the joy of it and for what the characters needed. 
So I went, to, I'm a big believer in asking for help. And I, I was, I had suffered writer's block in the past and I was afraid I was heading in that direction again. So I went to a therapist and I, and I explained what my fears were and the problem was. And, and she said, well, the wrong person's writing the book, which was not really all that helpful to be honest with you. I said, well, uh, who should be writing the book? And, and she said, well, your critic is writing the book. You need to thank your critic, you need to bless your critic, and you need to show the critic the door. And you need to, your, your, your creative self needs to write the first draft. And if you write 15 pages on a, a salt shaker, who cares? It's not gonna end up in the final draft, you know that. Just write, take chances, write with the joy of it, write with gratitude that you get to do this. This is your dream, you get to do it, how dare you be afraid. Um, and just take chances. So as a result, my first drafts really are smelly, soft and smelly. <laughs> would you, uh, would you uh, text me the name of your therapist, the phone number? <laughs> Does he or she do Zooms? Can we do it by Zoom? <laughs> I, it changed my life. Yeah. It changed my life. It gave me permission to be wrong, to make mistakes, to go down wrong paths. I'm just doing the second draft now of the next book. And the, the draft is a hundred and I think about 80,000 words this, and it should be 120. So I'm taking out huge sections. And as I do, I feel, I feel, oh my God, what an idiot, what fool wrote this. And then I remember, you know what? Your creative self wrote this and that your creative self put in a whole lot of good stuff too. And you, it's in there somewhere. So, yeah. Do you, uh, do you um, sometimes in, when you're in the middle of a book, and you think you know what you're doing, do you ever become really afraid? Yeah. Is the story working? Is it, is it gonna be, you know, whatever? It, it can I, is the ending gonna be satisfactory? Is it, uh, you know, is, is this whole idea gonna work? I mean, I, how often yeah. is, is this? The, is this the book that, that fails? Have, I, have yeah. I lost, have I lost it? Yeah, I do. I have, a, I have in front of, not here, but in Quebec where I do mo most of my writing normally. Uh, a poster with Seamus Heaney's, the Irish poet's last words. And, and on his deathbed, he said, Noli to marry, which means be not afraid. And I look at it every day as I write because I am afraid every day. And every day I have to. Uh, I've discovered as I get more gray hair, and I have a lot of it. Um, but for me, because fear has played a big role in my life, that I realize that I probably am not going to get rid of all the fear, that it's not for me less fear, it's about having more courage. Yeah. And that's, that's what I ask for every day is just, just whether it's writing or going out the front door with a mask on, just have more courage. Do you get afraid? There, there's at least one moment uh, in, every, in every book where, where even though I, I outline extensively and I know, I know the, one of my rules, you don't write the first scene until you know the last scene. You, you have to know where you're going. And so mm -hmm. I, I start, I start with that in mind. I know the last scene, it's kind of hard to get lost, but invariably um, I'm going to reach a point somewhere in the book where, um, yeah, I, I, I think this, this whole idea is ridiculous. This is not plausible. It's fiction can be anything, but fiction has to be plausible. Uh, you, you have to, you have to be realistic and, and I, yeah, I still worry about that. I, mean, I think it's a, probably a healthy thing, but it's, um, it's, it's something all writers face, I think. It's, it feels terrible, doesn't it, in those moments when you have that doubt, yeah. Yeah. the lack of the confidence, and, and you know, you still get it, you're, you're, you know, you're 35 books in, a, a phenomenal, and a, and a yeah. brilliant writer. Yeah. yeah. I think we are supposed I to. Your, by the way, I, the I, love, I just wanted to say that I loved your acknowledgments in the book. Since I only got it yesterday, it's all I had a chance to read. <laughs> Wow, I love these because you talked about making things up in, in the acknowledgments. You said, you know, I can't, I was too lazy to go back to read A Time to Kill, so sorry if I got some stuff wrong. And then you, you went on to say, and I've also made up some laws because, you know, when you were a young lawyer, you had to follow them, but now that you're a writer, you don't. I yeah, love I, that. I, I don't know how you do a series and keep all the uh, facts, names uh, straight from 16 books ago. I have this kids' series going. And um, the kid's 13 years old. He's a, he, he's, he thinks he's a lawyer. 
And after about four books, I started getting these uh, angry letters from 10 year old, to, from 10 year old kids who were reading book number five and finding mistakes from wrong names and streets and, and handbooks <laughs> from book one and two. So I said, oh, children. Oh my God. I'm not going to go back and read those books. I'm not going to go back and take notes on my own stuff. So I paid a summer intern to read all five books and, and give me a bibliography. <laughs> Anyway, but you know, that, that's, the, that's the treacherous part of a series is all the stuff oh, you've already written, right? It is. And my, I, I was very, very lucky that I, um, because I can't remember them. And I mean, I, I, I go on tour for a book that I had actually written essentially two years earlier. So I can't even remember the book I'm on tour with. But because now I'm writing two books further on. Um, I was very lucky that I had um, at Macmillan, at, at Minotaur Books, uh, St. Martin's Press, the most wonderful editor in Hope Dellen. And she was like the institutional memory for these. And I would write to her and say, what color eyes does Ren Marie have? Oh, well, they're brown. Well, you know, how old is so-and-so? How many children do they have? And she just, she would remember it all. Um, and unfortunately, she passed away last year, uh, earlier this year, actually. Uh, the funeral was just before the lockdown. And I miss her every day. And I, and I think of her as I'm writing and I think, what would Hope she was sort of the safety net because I knew she wouldn't let me fall. Oh, I mean, you, you dedicated, and I dedicated the book, All the Devils Are Here to Hope, and you dedicated this book to Sonny Mehta. Yeah, yeah. I got a nice note yesterday from Gita, his, his, his wife. I, I met him 25 years ago at a party in Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, they were down there on a book tour, and uh, a bunch of writers were down there, so we had a big, long dinner party one night. Sonny was not my editor until about... Um, he was always Knopf and, and, and Doubleday Penguin in one of the corporate mergers of 10, 15 years ago, uh, big random uh, acquired Knopf or Doubleday. I can't even keep up with all of them. But um, about 10 years ago, they reshuffled again and Doubleday, they put Doubleday under Knopf and Sonny became my editor. And, um, you I know, it was, yeah, it was, it was kind of a weird mix because, you know, the Knopf is a very literary house and and not really a uh, thought of as a you know commercial uh, place for people like me but Sonny treated me with a lot of uh, respect and we got along great and we weren't terribly close I, I never pretended I was close to him but uh, there was a lot of respect and uh, you know he, he's such a such a legend in American publishing and he's uh, he'll be greatly missed uh, yeah. at Random House. I, I hate to do this but I'm, I'm going to interrupt this wonderful conversation so that we can do a few questions before our time is up from the audience, if that's okay with you. Thank you so much for sharing um, such personal, wonderful details about your writing and your lives. Um, a few quick questions. So just tell us briefly, um, what is your favorite genre to read and who are some of your favorite authors? Louise? Um, the only sadness in a career that has been much more spectacular than I could have ever dreamed is that I can no longer read uh, in my genre. I don't read crime fiction um, anymore because I don't want to be influenced, um, all sorts of reasons. It, it feels like work and I, I want to read to escape. Um, so I read a lot of nonfiction now. I love nonfiction. Um, I'm trying to think. I'm just, I'm just reading uh, a book called The... Uh, I think it was the discovery of the chess queen, which is, I, I read all these sort of just strange books that nobody else could. I read a book on this, the, 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 the grasses of Scotland. <laughs> Who cares? But if it's well written, if the author is passionate about it, it's fascinating. So, I mean, what about yeah, you, John? It's funny you say that. It's not funny. It's, 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 uh, it's great to hear that because when I'm writing, when I'm writing, um, I I want to read writers who are better than I am, and there are a lot of them. And uh, when I when, so when I when I read a really good writer, fiction or nonfiction, but especially fiction, I will catch myself doing things I would not normally do, uh, just little little quirks that that, that 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 do not belong to me. Right, and it's because I've been influenced by somebody else. So I learned years ago: don't read fiction when I'm writing, and I'm writing fiction most of the time. Uh, I love nonfiction. I read a, uh, read a lot of books about stuff that I really can't recommend. Uh, 
legal issues, uh, capital punishment, wrongful convictions, things like that that I, I, that I love to read. Uh, but I, I kind of need that information and that knowledge for to, for the books. Uh, some of my favorite writers are nonfiction. People like Michael Lewis and David Graham, and Hampton Sides, and um, you know some, some really wonderful uh, nonfiction. Um, there's a guy named Ben McIntyre, who's a British guy who writes these uh, just uh, great books about uh, small stories from war and espionage, and he's written a bunch of them. Comes out every other year and. Uh, but, but when I'm when I'm at the beach, um, I'm going to read. There's some writers when they publish every year. I'm going to read their books right then. Uh, wow. James Lee Burke is one. Um, Scott Turow comes out every three years. I love Scott's books. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a lot of crime fiction, police procedurals, uh, suspense, mystery, old stuff. I'll go back and um, I've always loved Mark Twain. I'll go back and read an old Mark Twain book and laugh my butt off, you know, because he's the funniest guy in the world. So I'm all, I'm all over the place with reading. What um, do you think about writing a female protagonist? Uh, Wynn has asked if there might be one in either of your future books. Yes. Um, it's, it's, I find it difficult. Um, with my first novel years ago, my wife uh, informed me that my female characters really suck. And uh, I said, okay. She said, you have to think like a woman. And I said, that is impossible, okay? I, you know, I can't do that. Um, and I'm not sure I want to do that. Uh, but she's always, uh, she's always had her uh, editing pen ready for, for my female characters. And I saw, to, to prove her wrong, I've used a few over the years. Uh, and I used uh, in, the, in the past few years, well, Grey Mountain being one, The Whistler being another. And there's a good chance I'll go back there real soon for another uh, female lead. Mm -hmm. I, 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 when I first started writing Still Life, I thought the character of Clara, the artist, was going to be the main character, female lead. And it was going to be a sort of an, a, a modernization of... Um, the Nick and Nora Charles uh, books. Um, and then Gamash showed up unexpectedly and became, became the, the, the hero. And I think it became clear to me fairly early on that Gamash would have legs and probably Clara would not. But it is baffling to me and I have no, uh, no way to answer why as an Anglo woman, my main character is a francophone man. I, I don't know. I mean, he's inspired by Michael, my husband, so that helps. Um, and you talked about getting into the mind of a man, and I, and I try to do that, obviously. And I realize that I, I think what I'm trying to do is just get into the mind of a human. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that's one of the reasons Gamash is fairly successful, and the same with Jake, that there are, they're beloved because there are universal qualities that they bring um, to the situation. So you say gamash, we say gamash. So <laughs> we're Canadian, we're American. Uh, well, you must be right. Sorry about that. From now on, <laughs> gamash. Gamash. Well, you know, I think everybody says gamash, and I'm. I think I am the only human, except for <laughs> gamash himself, who says gamash. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. I can't tell you. What a wonderful hour this has been listening to you two. It's been the best lunchtime I've had for as long as I can remember. So thank you both thank you. so, so much. I want to thank real quick St. Martin's and Doubleday for um, publishing these authors' brilliant works and for keeping those um, out coming to us. So thank you all. Thank you, um, Penguin Random House, for letting us, hosting us on your Zoom account today. Um, and uh, thank you again, John and Louise. We um, hope that you both stay safe and keep writing. We are looking forward to what's coming next. So thank, thank you, you so much and um, hope to see everybody soon. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, thank you Louise. Ron. See you Take down there. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs>